A tender date in paradise would turn into tragedy. But even with the entire night recorded, opinions on who was to blame would be split right down the middle. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffee House Crime. Today's case is all about Warina Wright, and the evening that she met Gable Tosti in Gold Coast, Australia. By the way, if you're new to this channel, I post both solved and unsolved cases here on a weekly basis, so if that is your sort of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffee House Crime. So pull up a seat, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Warina Wright and Gable Tosti. Our case today briefly starts in a new location, the Philippines. Located slightly north of the equator, the Philippines are known for its abundance of beaches and delicious fruit, and contains a staggering 7,641 islands across the country. On the 20th of May 1988, Marina Wright was born in Bulacan, a province in the Philippines about 35 kilometers north of Manila, one of the country's most ancient areas. Life is laid back here, but early on in her childhood, at the age of one year old, her mother Merzabeth moved to Wellington, New Zealand, taking both Orina and her younger sister Marissa with her. Both sisters grew up in a relatively average happy fashion, and as the two grew up, their relationship strengthened and eventually were best friends. Orina was described as a practical joker with a soft spot for animals. She was good looking, intelligent, and caring. Her sister described her as a responsible best friend, who was also capable of making the best jokes around. In the year of 2014, Marina was 26 years old. She was working for Kiwi Bank in the credit card division. And although it didn't pay her in diamonds, it didn't pay too bad either. She had actually saved up enough to take time off from her job and travel to Australia. Her friend, who she'd met in a previous job, was getting married, and the wedding was set to happen on the Gold Coast, a city located south from Brisbane. And with July being in the middle of New Zealand's winter, why not? Gold Coast is exactly what it says on the tin. She was sure to have some fun in the warmer sun with her friends. And so on that note, on the 24th of July 2019, she packed her bags, left her home in Lower Hutt, and boarded a plane to Australia. The Gold Coast is an interesting place. To most people, it's a tempting spot of sun-drenched paradise. A city with a backbone of over 60 kilometers of Golden Beach. And to the other side, dozens of inland canals weave their way through clean skyscrapers. There's surfing, beach bars, water skis, water parks, and if all that's not enough, there's a theme park too. And if you just wanted to relax, there's plenty of spots to swim and sunbathe. So it was no wonder why Warina's friend decided to choose Gold Coast for her wedding. The time to celebrate came and went, and a week later on August the 6th, the wedding was over. But for Warina, the holiday was not. She decided to stay for a while longer to catch up on some more sea and sun, in the good company of her friend Savannah Lisa. It was over the next two days that Warina and Savannah hung out around the beaches and bars, taking selfies and cruising around the city. And it was during her time in the Gold Coast that Warina started using Tinder, an app designed to hook adults up, whether it be for talking, for drinks, or for something more. Back on the 1st of August, she had swiped right to a man named Gable Tosti, and he liked her profile back too. Over the next several days through to August the 7th, they kept in regular contact starting with simple flirting, but eventually ending up in heated conversation. Gable was allegedly a good-looking guy. He was a charmer, charismatic, and to Arena, he looked like an actor from one of her favourite TV shows. She liked him, and with the messages that he was sending her back, it was pretty obvious that he liked her too. With messages going well between the two, they decided to meet on the night of August the 7th for some drinks maybe heading back to Gable's place after, to see where it goes. He suggested that they should meet just off Cavill Avenue, a busy street in the heart of Gold Coast's tourist area. And Warina, she agreed. 
At 8.45pm, street surveillance cameras captured Marina meeting Abel outside a surf shop. The two awkwardly hugged before heading back towards Cavill Avenue. Three minutes later at 8.48pm, they entered the Surfer's Paradise Tavern Beer Garden. It seems, however, that the two had a change of plan, because only three minutes later, they left. They then walked to a nearby bottle shop, where they then purchased a six-pack of beer. And shortly after that, Warina reached Gable's home. Gable lived in an apartment at the Avalon Riverfront Apartments Complex, slap bang in the middle of the city. Now you would think that, considering the location of the apartment, Gable would be a hard-working, respectable man. And you would be forgiven for thinking that, because from the outside, it did look it. Well-kept hair and white teeth on a toned and tanned frame. But Gable... he had a past. Born in 1986 in Australia, Gable was a local man to the area. With two loving parents, he was well looked after as a child, but often was described as awkward throughout his teenage years. And as he grew up, he would run into the law several times too. Throughout his young teenage years, Gable developed an untamable relationship with alcohol, routinely drinking to dangerous levels and getting into a range of petty troubles. And in 2005, at the age of 18, that trouble would go up a notch. Gable was uncovered as the mastermind of a forgery scam which netted him and two friends over $30,000 between them. The three had made and sold fake ID cards to underage kids, so that they could gain entry to hotels during the schoolies season. From this, he was then also found to be counterfeiting banknotes. And although he was warned for his crimes, the judge did not convict him for any of it. Later on in 2011, Gable was caught behind the wheel intoxicated, and this landed him a hefty fine and disqualified his driver's license for 10 months. He did, however, avoid prison. And then, in the middle of July, just two weeks before meeting Marina, at 3am in the morning, police detected a Ford Falcon travelling without number plates on the Pacific Highway at about 100 miles per hour. The Ford Falcon belonged to Gable, and the driver was Gable. He had actually just attended the Splendour in the Grass Music Festival in Byron Bay, and was driving back home to his apartment in Gold Coast, when police noticed him speeding. After the pursuit commenced, Gable tried his hardest to evade police, even reaching speeds of up to 130 miles per hour. Police then threw spikes down on the road to try and blow his tyres, but even on his rims, he tried to get away. When police finally caught up with him, they found him to be four times over the drink drive limit. He was set on bail, and while he was, he continued on with his average everyday life. Gable was a carpet fitter. Nothing glamorous, but it paid the bills. He was actually banned from several venues for his strange behaviour. Even the manager of Sin City had banned him for life, after noticing him stalking young women and creeping them out. Gable also had a weird obsession with recording himself, meaning he would often record his nights out with women. He also had motion detection cameras in his house, and sometimes would even leave his phone on record in his pocket while in private company. Inside his home, he also kept a written log, the book full with the dates and names of women he had slept with. And with full intention, Marina Wright was unfortunately planned to be the next one. At 8.58pm, surveillance cameras captured Marina and Gable walking up to his apartment's elevator. Gable lived on the 14th floor, high up above the city's streets and bars. And although his apartment wasn't large, it was spacious, sporting one bedroom along with a comfortably sized living room leading on to a balcony. The two newfound friends started their night by drinking beer, and, Gable being Gable, he was actually secretly recording that night too. There was one more surprise to the night, however. A six-pack of beer was not going to cut it between two people, and so Gable introduced his homemade vodka, also known as Moonshine. Between the two, they would get horrendously drunk. They continued to drink, taking selfies together on the balcony, and eventually, they had sex. But shortly after, things started to become a little aggressive. What does it look like? Is it in there? Or? It looks like a fucking iPhone! Shit! Do you want me to ring it? Yeah, I'd love you to fucking ring it. What's the number? I'll find it. Yeah, we'll fucking... Compared to Gable, Warina was a small woman. And so, when the two started drinking moonshine together, she invertedly drank more than she could handle. Are you gonna fucking right moonshine me? Look. Because I will f No, c 
I will f***ing destroy your jaw. It's not f***ing funny. I don't deserve this shit, alright? I'm a nice f***ing guy. Uh, yeah. Had too much to drink, alright? I'm Just... not coming down because I've had so much to drink and I have shitloads of money in New Zealand. It's not funny. Inebriated by the unexpected strength of his vodka, Marina started to throw ornamental rocks at Gable. <laughs> Don't eat that. It's actually a real rock. Oh! Oh! What? And as the minutes moved on, Gable became more and more annoyed. So I thought you were kidding. And I've taken enough. This is f bullshit. You're lucky I haven't chucked you off my f***ing balcony, you goddamn psycho little b I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna walk you out of this apartment. Just the way you are. If you try to pull anything, I'll knock you out. Do you understand? Get up! Get up! Fuck up! Get up! forced Warina out of his room, but instead of taking her out to the front door, she was pushed out into the balcony and locked outside from inside. <coughs> from the audio, it is clear that she was terrified at this stage, and in her impaired state from the alcohol and therefore without any sound judgement, Warina then climbed the rail of Gable's balcony. She then went over the rail, trying to get to the apartment below slipped, and tragically fell 14 floors. She hit the ground, and immediately on impact, was killed. Gable's phone still recording captured the moment he realised that she had gone over. Within 30 seconds of her death at 2.22am in the morning, Gable made his first phone call. That phone call, it wasn't to police, it was actually to his lawyer. Hi, the person you have called is not available. Please Being early in the morning, however, the phone wasn't picked up. At 2.26am, just five minutes since Warina's death, a surveillance camera captures Gable leaving his apartment and reaching the ground floor of his building via the elevator. Upon seeing emergency services outside the front, he decides to backtrack his footsteps and leave through the underground car park, still recording with his phone. He then proceeds to walk Gold Coast's main strip, before sitting down and eating pizza. Shortly after that, Gable calls his dad and tells him the news, before asking if he could come pick him up. Gable's dad is shocked, but eventually decides to collect him. They then go home to the family's gated property. By the early hours of the morning, local media had become aware of Orina's death. And tragically, the details around her fall would be difficult to learn. Her body had suffered so much trauma from the fall that it was difficult for pathologists to learn how tall she was. A blood alcohol test of 0.156 confirmed that she was more than three times over the legal drink drive limit. And Gable was initially nowhere to be seen. That was until he arrived at a local police station with his lawyer later that afternoon. He chose to maintain his right to silence, but agreed to complete forensic testing. And within days, Warina was formally identified, and police seized Gable's audio recordings. And then, in a sudden twist of events, one week after Warina's death, Gable Tosti was officially charged with her murder. While in prison, Gable was subjected to violence from other inmates, but this time behind bars would be short. Because only three months later he was granted bail, and was able to leave prison on a $200,000 surety. Gable was banned from drinking alcohol, banned from using Tinder, banned from being on social media, and banned from being out of his parents' house after 6pm. 
But that didn't stop him from planting his time on the golf course, because over the next several months, he would do that extensively. He even posed for pictures just days before his trial was set. And eventually, in October 2016, Gable's trial would commence, but that trial would be messy and complicated. Prosecutors argued that Gable had left Orina in such a state of fear and intimidation that she felt the only way to escape was by climbing over the railing of his balcony, after he had locked her outside. But defence lawyers said that Gable had used reasonable force to stop Arena, who had become increasingly erratic after several hours of drinking. And right in the middle of the trial would be Gable's recording, which signalled evidence that he was not on the balcony when she fell off, but did highlight an abusive dialogue made by Gable, and even his previous threats, saying that she was lucky that she hadn't been thrown off the balcony already. Gable's trial would take six days, and the jury of six men and six women would take four days to deliberate, but at the end of it all, they'd come back with a verdict. They found Gable Tosti not guilty of the murder of Irina Wright, and not guilty of manslaughter either. It was concluded in trial that Irina fell from her own free will, and Gable had not contributed any major influence to those actions. He was officially released as a free man. Despite his release, Gable Tosti, who renamed himself to Eric Thomas, lashed out on social media shortly after. He lashed out at feminists, inequality, and the injustice he was put through which ultimately found him innocent. Yet, he also allowed the story to continue in the headlines by accepting multiple interviews with multiple Australian news sites, being paid up to $250,000 per contract. And while the media frenzy continued for Gable and his newfound fame, the family and friends of Arena continued to silently suffer. In the eyes of Australian law, Gable has been found innocent by all margins. But no matter what Gable's outcome would have been, nothing will bring Arena back to her loving family or friends. A lot of blame was pointed in her direction, and she was never given the chance to defend herself or her actions. What was going through her mind in those final seconds, no one will ever know or understand. It is without a doubt that she was terrified for her life early that fateful morning. And although she was drunk, she very likely had no idea how much alcohol she had been drinking from the homemade vodka. Being caught by surprise in severe inebriation, without any chance to think rationally or with clear reason, Warina was vulnerable to the new environment around her. One environment that eventually led her to be locked on a balcony 14 floors high. And Warina was more than just a victim to her tragedy. She should be remembered for everything else that she was. She was described as the kind of person who brought joy into the world of everyone around her. She had a wild humour, complemented by a kind spirit. The best kind of friend to have. And she will be remembered for all the kind and gentle things that she did for her family and her friends. And as for Gable, I'll let you come to your own conclusions. What do you think about Gable's involvement in this case? Please let me know in the comments below. I think with this case, opinions were split so far down the middle that it could be anyone's guess. Thank you for watching another case today by Coffee House Crime. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please remember to like the video, and if you haven't yet, please remember to subscribe. Thank you again for watching today, folks, and as always, I'll be right here, behind this camera, waiting for you in the next one. Until that moment arrives though, look after each other. Goodbye.